The Absolute at Large by Karel Chopek Translated by David Wiley Performed by Francis Bass Chapter 8 On the Dredger Motionless in the evening twilight lay dredger number ME-28 near the village of Stakovitsa. Its paternoster shovels had long since stopped lifting the cold sand up from the bed of the river Voltava. The evening was warm and without wind. The air was filled with the scent of cut hay and the breath of the woods. A sweet orange light still shone from the northwest. Here and there the ripples on the water glittered as they reflected the light of God's heaven. They sparkled, they whispered, and they shone with natural luminescence as they flowed downstream. A boat came out from the village and towards the dredger. It moved slowly against the current, black against the luminosity of the river, like a water beetle. "'There's somebody coming,' called out Kazinda, the diver, contentedly from where he sat in the stern. Two, replied the engineer, Breek, after a while. "'I know who that is,' said Mr. Kazinda. "'A pair of young lovers from the village,' said Mr. Breek. "'I'd better go and put the kettle on for them,' Mr. Kazinda decided, and he went below. "'Well now, children,' Mr. Breek called out to the boat. "'To the left! The left! Give me your hand, miss! Yes, up you come!' "'Joe and me,' the girl declared when she was on deck. "'We... we just wanted...' "'Good evening,' the young worker greeted him as he came up after her. "'Where's Mr. Kazenda gone?' "'Mr. Kazenda's just gone to make some coffee,' said the engineer. "'Sit down. Oh, look, there's someone else coming. Is that you, Baker?' "'Yes, it's me,' a voice replied. Good evening, Mr. Breek. I've brought the postman and the gamekeeper out to meet you. Come on board, brothers, said Mr. Breek. Once Mr. Kazinda's finished making the coffee, we can start. Is there anyone else coming? I am, a voice came up from the side of the dredger. Mr. Hoodetz, I'd like to come and hear you. Welcome, Mr. Hoodetz, the engineer called down to him. Come on up, here's the ladder. Let me shake your hand, Mr. Hoodetz. You haven't been here before. Mr. Breek, three people called out from the shore. Can you send a boat out here for us? We'd like to come and join you. Can you go and get them, Mr. Hoodetz? He called down. Everyone should be able to hear the word of God. Sit down where you can, brothers and sisters. It isn't dirty. Not since we've been using the carburetor. Brother Kazinda will bring some coffee, and then we can start. Welcome, young people. Come up on board. Then Mr. Breek went to the opening, where a ladder led down to the inside of the dredger. Hello, Kazinda. Ten people on board now. Fine. Mr. Kazinda replied from the depths of his beard. Be up with the coffee soon. So sit down, everyone, he said eagerly as he turned back to them. We haven't got anything more than coffee to offer you, Mr. Hoodetz. I hope you don't mind. Not at all, retorted Mr. Hoodetz. I only came here to see your... your... your session. Our religious service, Breek gently corrected him. We're all brothers here, you see. I suppose I'd better tell you that I used to be an alcoholic, and Kazinda was involved in politics before the grace of God came on us. And these other brothers and sisters, he continued as he gestured to the others, come to us each evening to pray that they too might receive the same gift of the Spirit. The baker here suffered from asthma until Mr. Kazinda healed him. Tell us what it was like, baker. Kazinda put his hands on me, said the baker with quiet enthusiasm and a kind of warmth suddenly flowed up and around in my chest. Something in me suddenly snapped, and I began to breathe freely, as if I was flying in heaven itself. Hold on a minute, Freak corrected him. Kazinda didn't put his hands on you. He didn't even know he was going to work a miracle. All he did was reach his hand out to you, and you said you could breathe. That's what happened. We were there, the girl from the village told them. The baker, he had light shining all round his head. And then Mr. Kazinda made my TB go away, didn't he, Joe? That's all completely true, Mr. Hoodetz, said the lad. But what happened to me was even stranger. I didn't used to be a very nice person, you see, Mr. Hoodetz. I've even been in prison for stealing things, and for something else, too. Mr. Breek here can tell you all about it. It was nothing, said Breek with a wave of his hand. The grace of God came upon you, that's all. But there are some very strange things that happen here, Mr. Hoodetz. I expect you can feel it yourself. Brother Kazinda can tell you about that, as he was the first to go to a meeting. Look, here he is now. Everyone turned to look at the hatchway that led from the deck down into the engine room. A bearded face appeared, bearing a forced, embarrassed smile, like someone who has been shoved from behind and wants to pretend nothing has happened. Only the upper half of Kazinda could be seen so far. 
In his hands was a large sheet of metal carrying cups and tins of milk. He grinned uncertainly and continued to rise. His feet now could be seen at the level of the deck, and he still continued to rise, cups and all. He did not stop until he hovered half a meter above the hatchway, his feet paddling the air, although he clearly wished they were on firm ground. Mr. Hudetz thought he must be dreaming. "'What's happened to you, Mr. Kazinda?' he exclaimed, almost in a panic. "'Nothing, nothing,' Kazinda excused himself, still trying to find firm air to stand on. Mr. Hudetz was reminded of a picture of the ascension that had hung over his bed when he was a child. In that picture, Christ and the apostles hung in the air, paddling their feet in exactly the same way, although the expressions on their faces had not been so anxious. Mr. Kazinda suddenly started moving forward over the deck. He floated, and floated through the evening air as if carried by a gentle breeze. Briefly, he raised his leg as if wanting to take a step forward, and he was clearly worried about the cups he was carrying. "'Please, take this tray from me,' he urged. Freak, the engineer, raised both his hands and took the metal sheet bearing the cups of coffee. Then Kazinda let his legs hang down, crossed his arms, and hung there without moving. With his head slightly to one side, he said, Welcome, brothers. Don't let it worry you that I'm flying like this. It's only a sign. Perhaps you'd like this cup, miss, the one with the flowers on it. Freak handed round the cups and offered the tinned milk. Nobody dared speak. Those who had not been there before stared inquisitively at Kazinda as he hovered in the air. Older guests sipped patiently at their coffee, and between each mouthful it was as if they were praying. "'Finished your coffee yet?' asked Kazinda after a pause, and he opened wide his pale and raptured eyes. "'I'll start then.' He cleared his throat, thought for a little while, and began. "'In the name of the Father! Brothers and sisters, we've come together for this religious meeting on the dredger, where the gift of grace is made manifest. There's no need for me to send anyone away who doesn't believe, or who's come to laugh at us and thinks he's being witty. Mr. Hudetz came here as a non-believer, and the gamekeeper came expecting to have some fun. You're both very welcome, but you ought to be aware that the gift of grace means I know one or two things about you. I know, for instance, that you like getting drunk, gamekeeper, and you chase poor people away out of the wood, and you shout insults at them when there's no need for any of that. Stop doing it. And Mr. Hudetz, you're an accomplished thief. Well, you know what I think about that, and you get cross with people much more quickly than you should do. Faith will correct you and save you. A deep silence reigned on the deck. Mr. Hudet stared firmly at the ground. The gamekeeper shed a tear, sniffled, and with a trembling hand reached into his pocket. I realize you'd like to have a smoke now, said Kazinda gently, still floating in the air. Light up if you want to. Just make yourself at home. Fish, whispered the girl, pointing down at the surface of the river. Look, Joe, even the carp have come to listen. They're not carp the blessed Kazinda told her. They're roughs, a kind of perch. Mr. Hodetz, you don't need to suffer for your sins. Look at me. I didn't care about anything but politics, and believe me, even that is sin of a sort. And gamekeeper, don't cry, I didn't mean to be nasty. Once anyone's got the gift of grace, he can see right through people. You can see right down into people's souls, can't you, Breek? I can, Mr. Breek confirmed. The postman here, he's wondering just now if you could help his little daughter, too. She's getting baptized. That's right, isn't it? And Mr. Kazinda will help her if you bring her here. Superstition, they call it, said Kazinda. Brothers, if anyone had told me about miracle working or about God when I was like I used to be, I'd have laughed in their face. That's how corrupt I was. Then we got this new engine here on the dredger, the one that runs without needing stoking all the time, and all our dirty work came to an end. Yes, Mr. Hudetz, that was the first miracle that happened here. The carburetor does everything all by itself, like a thinking being. Even the dredger does everything by itself. It knows where it's to go to, and just you look how it's staying in one place now. Look at the anchors, Mr. Hudetz, they're not even in the water. The dredger just stays in one place without anchors, and then it moves along when it needs to dredge another bit of the riverbed. It starts work by itself, and it stops work by itself. Mr. Breek and me, we don't need to lift a finger. And you can't tell me that's not a miracle. When we saw what was happening, it got us thinking. And then it became clear to us. The dredger is divine. It's an iron church, and we're only here as its priests. If the Lord God used to appear in spring water, or in a grove of oak trees like the Greeks had, or sometimes in a woman, why shouldn't he appear on a dredger? Why on earth would he have any aversion to something just because it's a machine? A machine can sometimes be purer than a nun. And Breek keeps his machine polished up like something you'd put on your sideboard. 
But that's by the by. And just so as you know, God isn't infinite like the Catholics say. He's about 600 meters wide and he gets weaker near the edges. The strongest place is here, on the dredger. It's here that he does his miracles. But on the bank he only gives second sight and conversions to the faith. In the village, when the wind's in the right direction, you can only smell him, like a kind of holy scent. One time some boats from the rowing club came by, and all of the rowers were given the gift of grace. That's how powerful it is. And what God wants of us, that's something you can only feel here, inside, preached Kazinda, pointing to his heart. I know he can't stand politics or money, reason or pride or social climbing, and I know he loves people and animals, and he's very glad to see you all here, and he likes to see good acts. He's a real Democrat, brothers. If we can't, that is, Breek and me, if we don't spend our money on coffee for everyone, then every penny we have burns us in our pockets. One day, a Sunday it was, there was a couple of hundred people here, sitting on both banks they were, and what do you think? That coffee increased in quantity so that there was enough for everyone, and what coffee it was! But all these things are just signs, brothers. The greatest miracle of all is the influence he has on how we feel. It's such a wonderful feeling it makes you shudder. Sometimes you seem to have so much love and happiness in you you think you're going to die. It's as if you were at one with the water down there, and with all the animals and the earth and the stones. Or it's as if you were being held in some magnificent embrace. Well, I can never really tell you what it's like. Everything around you is singing and shouting. You understand everything without words, the water and the wind. You can see right inside everything around you, how they're all connected with each other and with you. Everything all and at once. You understand it all better than if you had it down in black and white. Sometimes it comes over you like a fit. You almost think you must be foaming at the mouth. But other times it comes on you slowly and creeps gradually till it's penetrated into your tiniest veins. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing to be afraid of, but there's a boat coming here with two policemen in it. They want to make us disperse because this meeting hasn't been given official approval. But just wait. Just be patient and trust in the God of the dredger. It was already dark, but the whole deck of the dredger and all the faces of the people on it shone with a gentle glow. Down on the water, the oars of a boat could be heard as they suffed through the water and came to a halt. Hello? A man's voice shouted up at them. Is there a Mr. Kazinda there? Here I am, said Kazinda in a voice like a cherub. Just come up on board, brothers. I already know that the landlord in the village told the police about me. The two policemen climbed up onto the dredger's deck. Which of you is Kazinda? the sergeant asked. I'm Kazinda, officer, he said, as he floated up higher above the deck. Please, come up here and join me. The two policemen promptly rose into the air to where Kazinda hovered. Their feet paddled the air in vain for some kind of firm support. Their hands grasped at the empty air. Their anxious gasps could be heard by all. Don't be afraid, officers, Kazinda generously reassured them. Join with me in prayer. Dear Father God, who has come to be present in this ship, Dear Father God, who has come to be present in this ship, the sergeant repeated in a strangulated voice. Dear Father God, who has come to be present in this ship, hurriedly joined in Mr. Hudetz as he threw himself down on his knees, and a choir of voices on the deck of the dredger all joined in. Chapter 9. A Celebration Cyril Kevel, Prague reporter for an important newspaper, jumped into a taxi and hurried off to Stvanice, even though it was past six in the evening, where the grand opening of the new central electricity carburetor was to take place. The new carburetor was to power the whole of the Prague region, and there was a dense crowd of onlookers, even penetrating the three-deep line of policemen and reaching the walls of the little concrete building hung with flags. From inside, the swearing of the workmen could be heard as, needless to say, they were behind schedule and now were in a rush to get the installation ready on time. The whole building was no bigger than a public toilet. Another newspaper man, old Mr. Chvan Chara from a little nearby town, ambled past, lost in thought, looking somewhat like a heron deep in philosophy. When Mr. Chvan Chara saw his younger colleague, he gave him a friendly greeting. You can be sure something is going to happen here today, Mr. Kevel. I've never yet seen a parade like this where someone didn't do something stupid, and that's over forty years' experience of them. Isn't this amazing? answered Kevel. 
a little building like this, and it'll be lighting the whole of Prague and powering all the trams and trains within seventy kilometers and thousands of factories and. The skeptical Mr. Chvanchara shook his head. We shall see, my friend. We shall see. When you're as old as I am, there's not much left to surprise you. But, and here Mr. Chvanchara lowered his voice to a whisper. Perhaps you haven't noticed, but nobody has thought to build a reserve carburetor. If this one breaks down, or perhaps somebody blows it up, then, er,、uh, do you understand my point? Kevall felt ashamed that he had not thought of this point himself. But that's out of the question. He began to object. I've been reliably informed that this generator is only a decoy. The real generator is really in, in. His voice dropped to a whisper as he pointed underground. I'm not at liberty to tell you exactly where, but you may have noticed that they've been replacing a lot of the pavements in Prague lately. They've been doing that for the past forty years," said Mr. Chvanchara thoughtfully. "Yes, exactly," retorted Cyril Kevall triumphantly. "Military purposes, you see, an enormous system of underground passageways, storerooms, armories, all that sort of thing. My informants are very precise on this matter. There are sixteen strong rooms holding underground carburetors all around the city." Not a sign of them above ground. All you see are football grounds, lemonade stalls, a monument to some patriot. But, haha, beginning to see what I mean, are you? Why do you think they've been putting up so many of these monuments? Young man, Mister Chvanchara objected. What does the young generation know about war? There's a thing or two that we could tell you. Ah, here comes the mayor, the new minister of war too. There, you see, I told you. The technical director, the managing director of M E A S, the chief rabbi. The French ambassador, the minister for public works. Perhaps it's time for us to go inside. The archbishop, the Italian ambassador, the speaker of the upper house, the head of the National Sports Association. You see, my friend, there's nobody they've left out. Just then, Cyril Kevall allowed a lady to step in front of him, separating him both from the senior journalist and from the crowd of invited personalities continuously flowing in at the entrance. Then the national anthem was heard. An order was given to the guard of honor, and the head of state appeared, accompanied by men in top hats and uniforms, as he went up the red carpet into the concrete structure. Mr. Kevall stood on tiptoe, cursing the gallantry he had shown to that lady, and aware that now he had no chance of entering the building. Schwanchara was right, he thought. There's always someone who does something stupid. How could an opening ceremony as big as this fit into such a small building? So he would report the speeches to the news agency, and the rest he'd just have to make up. Touching moment! Great progress! Spontaneous ovation for the head of state. Inside the building, everything suddenly went quiet, and somebody began to recite the celebratory speech. Mr. Kevall yawned and, his hands in his pockets, walked all round the little building. It was getting dark. The policemen were wearing white gloves and carried ceremonial batons. There was a press of people on the banks of the river. The speech went on too long, as always. Who was even giving it? Then Kevall saw a little window. About two meters above the ground, in the concrete wall of the generator building, he did not hesitate, but jumped up, caught hold of the iron bars, and pressed his clever face in at the window. Ah, so it was the mayor of Greater Prague who was speaking. His face as red as a roast pig. Next to him stood G. H. Bondi, the president of M. E. A. S. His lips pressed tightly together. The head of state had his hand on the lever, ready to start the machine as soon as the signal was given. At that moment, the whole of Prague would be lit up by the new generator. Celebratory music would ring out, and fireworks would shoot into the sky. The minister for public works fidgeted in irritation. It would clearly be his turn to speak once the mayor had finished. A junior army officer pulled at his mustache. Ambassadors pretended to be giving devoted attention to the speech of which they understood not a word. Two delegates from the trade unions didn't even blink. In short, everything was going smoothly. Thought Mr. Kevall as he jumped down from the window. So he walked round the streets for a while, came back to the generator, and jumped back up at the window. The mayor was still speaking. When Kevall listened hard, he could hear, "At this point in the history of our nation," so he quickly jumped back down, found a place to sit down, and lit himself a cigarette. It was already quite dark. Above him, the stars sparkled between the branches of the trees. I wonder why the stars didn't wait till the head of state pulled the lever before lighting up. He thought. Apart from the stars, Prague was dark. The river Vltava flowed through the blackness with no glitter of lamplight to reflect on its waters. Everything lay in anticipation of the festive moment when the lights would come on. Once Kevall had finished his cigarette, he went back to the generator and pulled himself back up at the window. The mayor was still speaking, and his face was now so purple it was almost black. The head of state stood with his hand on the lever. All the personages present were talking quietly among themselves, and only the foreign ambassadors were listening motionless. 
Right at the back of the room, Kevel could see the head of Mr. Chvanchara swaying uncertainly on his shoulders. Physically unable to go on any longer, the mayor finished his speech. His position was taken by the Minister for Public Works, and it could be seen that he was truncating his sentences to make his own speech as short as possible. The head of state took hold of the lever in his left hand. Old Billington, doyen of the diplomatic corps, died on his feet but, even in death, continued to give the impression of giving close attention. The minister finished his speech abruptly. G. H. Bondy lifted his head. He looked gloomily round the room and said a few words, clearly something about M.E.A.S. dedicating its work to the public for the good of the city, and that was it. The head of state stood upright and pulled the lever. The whole of Prague was lit up with boundless light. The crowd cheered, all the bells and all the churches rang out, and the cannons in the fort thundered. Kevel looked round from the bars of the window he was hanging on to and viewed the city. From Sturgeliki Island in the Voltava, rockets shot into the air and sparkled. Radchani, Petergine, and Letna all shone with garlands of light bulbs. In the distance, music could just be heard. Above him circled illuminated biplanes. An enormous car passed by, hung with Chinese lanterns. The crowd took off their hats. Policemen raised their hands to their helmets as still as statues. Two batteries of guns were now firing salutes from the fort followed soon after by a reply from Carlene. Keval pressed his face back to the window to see the conclusion of the ceremonies around the carburetor, but when he did so, he boggled at what he saw and shouted in alarm. First unable to turn away from the window, he said something like, Oh, God! But then somebody running away from what he had seen knocked into him as he fled so that Keval let go of the bars and fell heavily to the ground. Keval caught hold of his coat before he could get away, and the man looked round. It was G. H. Bondi, and his face was deathly pale. What's happened? jabbered Keval. What's going on in there? Let go of me, gasped Bondi. For God's sake, let go of me! Get yourself out of here! But what's happened in there? Let go of me, shouted Bondi as he knocked Kevel back with his fist and disappeared between the trees. Somewhat shaken, Kevel leant against the trunk of one of them. There seemed to be some kind of barbaric chanting coming from inside the concrete building. A few days later, the papers bore this vague announcement. Contrary to reports in one Czech newspaper and repeated abroad, we have been reliably informed that no untoward events occurred at the festive inauguration of the Central Carburetor in Prague. In connection with these events, the mayor of Greater Prague has closed his office and is receiving medical treatment, but Mr. Billington, on the other hand, is alive and active. The truth of the matter is that all present declared they had never before experienced anything as powerful as this. It is the right of every citizen to fall to his knees in praise of God, and in a democratic state there is no official restriction on the performance of miracles. It is certainly most inappropriate to suppose the head of state was involved in any way with these regrettable events, which were merely the result of inadequate ventilation and nervous strain. This recording is under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Music was composed by John Philip Sousa and performed by the United States Marine Band. The book was written by Karel Chopek, translated by David Wiley, and performed by Francis Bass.